so Kendrick, um, you have an amazing life. You started selling caviar in high-end places in Las Vegas, and now you propose shares of Ample Food, which is an organic brand of food that is widely democratized and distributed through micro-investments uh, on a very sustainable platform leveraging blockchain. Uh, and you're a, you have a legal background. You, you are a former fellow at Stanford Law. Um, and you could on your spare time, but you don't want to say it in front of everyone at Google, right? So that's basically a few things. I would that say I I'm non-technical, particularly <laughs> in this room. <laughs> so um, the first thing I want to ask you, because we just used a lot of buzzwords there in a, a very few sentences, uh, is the story of four dogs. So there's a dog from Angel List, uh, a dog from uh, you know the tech, a dog from Wall Street, and a street dog, right? A normal, a normal dog. And the dog from Angel List says, you know, when I want more money, what I do is that I, I leverage tokens from a blockchain to do micro investment in startups. Uh, uh, and the dog from tech says, wait, 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 wait. What's a micro investment in a startup? And the dog from Wall Street says, hold on, what's what's a blockchain, right? And the dog from the street says, what's money? Because he, he hasn't come up with a lot of money in his life. So uh, this is a, you know, I don't want it to be a dog eat dog situation. <laughs> <laughs> I want us to understand every dog's perspective in this. So how can you make it clear to, you know, to every perspective that we can have on this, what you're doing exactly and what your company, because you're an entrepreneur, a founder of Republic, which is a, a part of AngelList, what your company does uh, and that every dog would understand. I love that hypothetical. And I think when it comes to investing, it's definitely not dog eat dog, and it's more like dog feed dog world. Oh. In this one sense, um, I think the easiest way to look at money is that it's a form of energy and a medium of exchange. Today we use you know, dollar here, the pound in uh, England, but anything can actually be a medium of exchange. So you need money to drive that energy and grow an idea into a business condition necessary. The question is, how do you get more people to do that, and how do you break this energy down into smaller pieces? And if you can do that through blockchain technology, then you have that much more energy directed into this ecosystem, and net-net, more ideas will grow into more businesses. So the way I look at investing is that if you manage to make and to encourage everyone to invest even a s tiny amount of money into this whole ecosystem and direct that money to where they believe the future should be in terms of entrepreneurship and companies and products, then we're just gonna have that much more prosperous of an ecosystem overall. Okay, so the micro investment part I get from this, how about the blockchain part? Like why would you use blockchain for this? The uh, currently, the reason why it would take, it would cost probably about twenty, fifty thousand dollars minimum if you want to invest into real estate, even a REIT, is that the cost of transferring, of uh, making it possible for people to buy a lot of, uh, you know, a stake in a building or home would be so high, the cross of processing, of validating, of confirming your interest, and when, when you want to sell that interest, it's gonna be equally burdensome. Blockchain technology, one use case of it is fractionalization and automation. If you can break the Mona Lisa down to a billion pieces, you can have a billion people around the world owning a piece of the Mona Lisa. Yes, it's only worth probably a fraction of a dollar, but you're owning a piece of the Mona Lisa. And that's only able recently through blockchain technology that you can fractionalize things to that degree. And that it costs next to nothing to transfer a tiny fraction of an asset between two individuals. Hmm. I have a feeling Leonardo da Vinci would have loved your idea, right? So, <laughs> um, and be very interested in the mechanism. So what I get from this is that this micro-investment, which is a form of expression of crowdfunding, but more organized, right? More uh, on a platform. You're standing somewhere between crowdfunding and an IPO, right? Uh, there is this middle space that has not really been invested, if I might use the word before, in which uh, initiatives need money, 
And why wouldn't you come at this earlier than the formal IPO, which return investment might not be so, so high? Because now there's the technology, and if I know this well, also the regulation for this. Uh, early investing naturally comes with higher risk and much higher return. So I think most people uh, nowadays in this ecosystem know that Uber is about to file for IPO. People who are buying in post-IPO, pretty much anyone who's not a millionaire, will see a return or a depreciation, but you know, 2x, 3x, or 20% loss. Obviously, if you invested $10 in, or $100 into Uber's very first round on AngelList, today that's going to be worth somewhere between $1.5 to $2 million on face value. So getting in early is definitely a value proposition. But it wasn't legal until 2016. Up until two and a half years ago, you got to be a millionaire to invest in private companies. And I'm glad that the world is very different now. All right. And so that's when your legal background comes into play, because you knew the law had just changed and that it opened a, a huge new opportunity for people to invest, because they don't need to, have cert to be certified investors, if I get this right. And so then the question is, how do we organize this to work efficiently for everyone, right? Am I right in this? Absolutely. So obviously, the law is there to make sure that people aren't out there defrauding you know, grandmas and people with very little um, ex dispensable income. Now, on the other hand, 99% of the world, of the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, 99% of people have never made a private investment. So they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Everyone had taken a cab or a taxi, almost everyone, before Uber. So when they made it possible, it was just a natural leap. What we're trying to do is to get everyone to do something that they have never be done before. So it's a much more challenging journey from the branding, marketing exposure, as well as legal and business. All right. So I went to your platform as part of the preparation for mm -hmm. this talk. Uh, I discovered the breadth of products that you have there. It's amazing. You go from Ample Food, which I mentioned, uh, to uh, some more tech startups. Can you tell us how do you curate the propositions? Because I still want to know that my dollars are invested in a place that is kind of safe or curated. And I think you provide that service. Uh, given that AngelList is our institutional co-founder and our team um, has a heritage back to the venture, the VC lens, so we do apply some natural lens. Is there a credibility? Uh, founders have domain expertise. On the other hand, I fundamentally believe that people should invest for any number of reasons. Maybe they just want to support women founders. Maybe they want to get some return back from that food truck and not necessarily a thousand X in a tech company. So if the vision is to build Amazon for private investing, where you have thousands and thousands of companies and millions and millions of people participating, then one of our core focus is to present as many options, credible, viable options as possible, and let the crowd follow their heart and their head and make the decision for themselves. All right. So I got a better idea of, of what you do at Republic. Uh, you allow everyone to make micro investments, even a few dollars, without overheads because the technology is there, without legal constraint because the regulation has changed, and there's this new highway of potential investment open. Uh, however, my mother told me never to gamble, uh, you know, and uh, I don't know that I've been such a good son, but uh, what, what would you say about the risk reward? And is this for mm. everyone? Or is this something that, you know, how do you reassure me that you're not about to create the next subprime crisis with your idea? Of course. Uh, you know, even when it comes to gambling, it's not so much that you should never gamble. I think that people should do whatever it is that they want to do if they are fully aware of the risks and the consequences. So if you know that gambling likely is going to result in total loss of money, but you have a lot of fun doing it, and you can afford that $50 at the slot machine, by all means, in my opinion, you should do it. Obviously, the risk of gambling is very high. Now, when it comes to early stage investing, the risk is still high, not as high. But every single year, about $100 billion are being spent at the casino not by millionaires, mostly by non-accredited people. Another $80 billion into a lottery ticket. Can you imagine what the world would be with Silicon Valley and the US and the 
world at large would be if 10% of that $180 billion per year get invested or gambled informally into new innovations that has that opportunity to change our world. So basically, you're saying uh, the micro investment is worth the risk. What do you have to lose? It's a few dollars. Uh, what, is, what is the average amount of people that people spend on your platform? If I may uh, take the answer one question about money, this is my more like my personal view. Please. I think generally, from what I observe, uh, how people spend fall into three categories. One is the basic necessity, you know, putting food on the table, buying toothpaste, feeding your kids, you have kids. The second one is for enjoyment, for value. You know, you go out and buy a nicer jacket and you necessarily need, you take a kite surfing lesson. And the third one is for growing that capital that will, able, that will enable you to do number one and two. So obviously don't spend any money that you absolutely need to feed yourself and your family in the casino or in investing for that matter. When it comes to micro-investing, $100, $500, investing, not buying a product, I think it's a blend between two and three. It is quite satisfying if I really believe in that food truck founder and her food and her resilience day in and day out, and she decides to fundraise to build a Mexican restaurant, and I invest $200 into it. You know, if she doesn't make it, I'm, st I'm still rooting for her. Now, if I'm investing $200,000 into it, I probably would want to know that I can get you know, the money back or that she would do so well that I could make you know, two or three times as much. But when it comes to micro-investing, you, you, you will be able to let people gamble or make informed decisions and have fun between two and three. How, how is it different from crowdfunding? Let me give a very quick definition of crowdfunding. Uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, whereby you go on and buy a product that hasn't been made, that's generation one of crowdfunding. Okay. And that's back in 2008 or so. Mm -hmm. Then you have 2011, AngelList came into the mix that allowed millionaires to co-invest into tech deals. So that's the second wave of it. And when Republic launched in 2016, that allows anyone, anywhere of any income and net worth, invest as little as 10 or $20 into businesses, that's crowd investing, still crowdfunding. I think all of us can agree that there's a different psychological attachment when you invest, when you have an interest in something compared to buying a product. I used to work for the guy who founded Sky Vodka, and I don't think there's a difference between absolute vodka and Sky Vodka. But if you, Bryce, had made a $50 investment into Absolute, when you go out to the bar with me at the end of the day, you're going to buy me Absolute shots. You're going to serve up that kind of that brand of vodka you know, over the holidays in July 4th. So that notion of engagement, of commitment, of having skin in the game, I think is what going to drive crowd investing into a new trend. And indeed, that's the underlying foundation of a token economy of using tokens to incentivize participants. All right, so what I understand is that crowdfunding might be more before there's a product. Uh, Micro-investment is at the early stage when there is something and you know what you're investing into, but you still have attachment because you're still such an early contributor to this that you want to serve that vodka to your friends or, or that strawberry juice. And that you potentially get that return and share in that outsized growth. Because this is more a, re a return on investment perspective than the crowdfunding, which might be just you're buying something really and paying for it. Correct. Uh, and it's still early enough before there will be a, a stock exchange play that you have the, the huge reward curve if you're investing on the right thing and that your, your passion and your gut goes along with the market. A hundred percent. All right. So thank you for all these explanations. It's already very, very interesting. Now, I would like to, uh, to go on the, the step further because you are in the middle of a, of a lot of trends and each of them collide in what you're doing right now. Uh, how do you see the future of, uh, of investment? Because, so 
let's say that Republic is the present of investment because I can go today on Republic. It's republic.co, right? So it's for everyone who yeah. wants to. Not uh, .com, .co, not, .co. .co, not <laughs> .com, all right? Uh, you, you, you got rid of the M, right? And so republic.co and watch your, your platform and how it works and operates. Um, so I understand the past, I understand the present, and this, this very new initiative and interesting way to see it. How do you, what are you going to launch? What are you dreaming about? How do you, how do you foresee the future? What is your take on the future of investment? First, let me just share one tidbit about the present and the funding landscape. I don't know how many people even here in, at Google and in the heart of Silicon Valley realize that 50%, 5-0, of all venture capital go to businesses in California. Another 50% go to just social apps. Um, African-American founders, African-American women founders, are responsible for $30 billion worth of revenue businesses founded by African-American founders are responsible for tens of billions of dollars, and statistically, 0% get funded on certain years. So mm. if we can agree that good ideas exist everywhere, that no community, no city, no heritage has a monopoly on innovations that, if funded, can mature into the Google, the Apple of the world 10 and 20 years from now, then there's a lot of work to get done. So now to answer your question, what's the future? I think the future is indeed that if not 80 or 90 percent, then 50, 60, 70 percent of adults would look at micro-investing, 10 and 20 dollars at a time, as a way, as a new way, as a new spending behavior, similar to or adding on to whatever else they've been doing. Think of it as a social engagement, almost like recycling, but adding on to that potential for mm -hmm. growing the capital, that the saving that you have. And I think there's no question in my mind that Amazon for private investing will be the future. The people will be investing as easily and quickly and cheaply as buying a product on Amazon. And once we get there, I think we can eradicate global poverty once and for all. Because investing in a new day and age when technology reduces, not increases jobs, how do you lower the income gap? By allowing people to invest 10 20 $30 and have that opportunity to you know, get a major distribution and realize their potential in different ways. Wow, it's a pretty bold vision. Thank you for sharing it. Um, one thing that I forgot to ask you: How do you make money for Republic out of out of this? Like, where you know, how do how does your system operate financially? Well, currently, full disclosure, we're about three years out, and we definitely are not making money. We are completely venture backed, uh, losing. Uh, we're very much in the red. Hopefully, one day we will we'll be making money, but we have a cash commission. Uh, out of the amount being raised, as well as a small interest in every single company that successfully raises on Republic. Mm. So in a way, if one of the companies that had raised on Republic in 10 years does an IPO at the size of Uber or Airbnb, then Republic would do very well. Now, we're going through an initiative that we aim to tokenize our future revenue and give them back to every user and investor and partner on Republic. Mm. So that if and when we get that major distribution, that all the hundreds of thousands of early believers in Republic can benefit in that as well, monetary-wise. So if I'm investing in Ample Foods on Republic, I'm also somehow investing in Republic. Correct. So currently, not yet. Okay. Currently, if you invest in Ample Food, and if they get bought out for 10x, and you invest $100, you know, give or take, you're gonna get about $1,000 back. But very soon, we will be giving, for, for making an investment on Ample Food or in any project, let's say 100 Republic tokens, each token at one point will represent a portion of future income that Republic takes in. Okay. So that, imagine back when, in the early day, um, when Amazon just had 10 companies on the platform, 
and they had given out a billion tiny little slivers. And each sliver represent revenue from each of the company. At the time, it may not mean much, but now, 20 years later, it can be very substantial. So that's very interesting because what I understand from this is that this way for you to monetize your services, for one thing, tells us that you, you have skin in the game of the companies that are on your platform, that you believe in them enough that you took a small share yourselves. And this system also allows you to create the transaction system that is completely uh, zero cost, right? Like, like if I have a share of any company on your platform and in five years they, they are really doing super well, I can divide my, my token in as many as I want because it's infinitely uh, divide, dividable, I don't know how you say it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can infinitely divide it and then transfer this to anyone globally in the world without any overhead or expense. Am I right in understanding this? Yes. Uh, how, me, how much or how into how many pieces you break it down uh, and who to grant it to, that's the realm of token economics uh, and the different ways of incentivizing people. But absolutely, back when Google was still a private company, um, an employee holding 1,000 shares, um, in order for her to transfer it to her sister, say, in Singapore, um, first you got to get the consent of the company. Then you have to go through the transfer agent. Then you have to sign probably about four set of documents, both counterparties signing. The company would need to do background checking with CML on the sister. And that's why that process is so inefficient that transfer of private securities, even today, is heavily, heavily limited. Blockchain technology and the, the new application of it in the months and the years to come will make that process even more seamless than public stock trading today. Um, and I think, again, it would just bring that more of that energy mm. that feed into these budding uh, companies around the world. Mm. Um, and I want to talk about the offer side of the equation. So we, we, right now we talked about uh, how you orchestrate the platform we talked and, and what liberated this initiative on the basis of technology and regulation changing. We talked about the, the, the part of the people who need funds. We talked a little bit about the part of the, of the, of the investors. Let's say tomorrow I want to monetize something that has never been monetized before. Mm -hmm. So let's take an example that at Google we talk about a lot or we hear about a lot, which is our data. People say to me all the time, how about my data? It has value, you know, uh, and you use that value. And there's, there's a huge conversation because I think they gain value against that value from using the services for free. And it has, they, it's a topic from DC to Europe down to the private citizens. Yes, right? and so, right now it's, it's like a, a very top of mind topic for everyone, especially in this day and age. So let's say tomorrow populations wanted to monetize their data. Right, that they would say, all right, let's create a, a, a platform uh, together to put our data together. Maybe individually my data is not worth so much, but maybe as part of, I don't know, uh, uh, my income level in, uh, on the West Coast, or uh, I'm French, so as part of the French community living abroad, or you know, any identity, maybe some companies would be interested in purchasing some of my data. Could I use a platform like Republic and the new regulation and the arrival of blockchain to somehow put my data willingly, knowingly on the market and decide how my data is going to be purchased, traded, bought, and so on in a way that I feel to be transparent and empowered? Uh, absolutely. Certainly not on Republic today because we're currently uh, more of an investment platform. But there are two elements of blockchain technology that would, in my opinion, solve uh, in major ways or in meaningful ways, the data privacy concern. One is that security but decentralized so that you don't have to worry about a central party holding all relevant information getting hacked. And so that in and by itself does ease the security concern. And the second one, one of the main, using probably my own psychological uh, attachment or assessment of this particular data question. And I think that even though, yes, I agree to the terms, but I didn't know quite that I was consenting to providing all of these personal information and data to a couple central parties. 
And I'm certainly not feeling like I'm being incentivized by it. If you apply a token economy around it and enable people to make money when or share in that, that economic value of data and the choice to opt out, I think you're going to get so much opting in that net net it benefits everyone and it still serve that same purpose of using data to analyze, to produce, and put out better products that serve you know, human at large as a, as a community. All right. So I took a very extreme case because it's very dematerialized or people's data. Uh, but what I understand from this discussion up to now is that the shift uh, in paradigm that you're here to, to talk to us about is both democratizing the investment and what is being proposed for investment and creating this new space in which people, for the price of a lottery ticket, could actually apply uh, value to their values, <laughs> value to their commitments, participate to things that are already there and that are already started and visible, and gain the traction of early investment. And that this is probably going to profoundly reshape the way we create monetization out of various elements of, of investment that today are, are still believed to be very restricted to a system with a cost base, with knowledge and expertise, and that maybe tomorrow all these things are going to fly out the window and will be available for a lot of people, truly democratized. A hundred percent. I think the next Facebook, um, the first investors in the next Facebook should not be Peter Thiel's of the world, but be the 500 doormates of the founders. Hopefully, it doesn't have to be a Harvard. It can be a women's college out of Pakistan. And that the next wave of founders can be a single mom in Ecuador reading about it and putting in 10 and $20. And that by the time the banks and the venture funds or whatnot get in, everyone else get in more and more. And that when there's an IPO event, like the one that's going to produce 100,000 millionaires in the Bay Area, that there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people benefiting all at the same time. So I think the last um, wave of venture capital, the last 30 years has reduced, has lifted 1.3 billion people out of abstract poverty in the world. We've been living in the most, in, in a better time than ever before. But the, much of the fruits of it in terms of wealth has gone back to the wealthiest and the institutions. If we can encourage everyone and make it possible, a small amount, for everyone to buy in, I think the world 20 years from now will probably be almost like sci-fi fiction where there's very little. Uh, you know, the wealth is just across the board, standard of living can be lifted from all corners of the world. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was very enlightening. I loved both preparing this with you and having this conversation. Time for us to open to uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, any question, any comment, anything you would like to ask, Kendrick, please. So I uh, went uh, to the platform, and there is one thing I don't understand here. Um, when I invest a certain amount, do I get equity in the company? Do I like own 2% of that startup now? Or how exactly does that work? Yep. So each of the deals on the investment, and thank you so much for, for joining, uh, each of the deals on the platform has its own set of terms. Some of the companies are already venture-backed. They've raised tens of millions of dollars. And now they just want to bring, provide an opportunity for their customers and fans to get in. So typically, it would say a valuation. For example, the document would say that you're investing $1,000 and at the company's valuation of $10 million. So usually, with investing, what that means is that later on, if Google buys that company at 100 million, then you would get 100x, give or take, on your own personal investment. So in a way, yes, it's, it's skin in the game. It's buying in. It's not share, there's a range of distinction between shares and stock and debt and save and convertible notes. But the general thesis is very much the same, that if the company does well, you will do well proportionally so as well to contrast against buying a product or making a loan and get a fixed income return back. 
So sharing in that success and that growth, I think, is a psychological uh, satisfaction and validation that a lot of people in tech have experienced. Has that answered your question? Yes. And to be very clear for everyone who hears this, because uh, we all understand the concept of share and being a shareholder, uh, when I invest through Republic, what am I and what do I have? How do you call this? What is it? You're an investor. Okay. But in most cases, you're not a shareholder yet. You're just an investor to make it simple for the company and the founders. So in FinTech, uh, it's a confluence of law and regulations on the one hand and innovation on the other hand. So you have a set of laws that was written some 80 years ago at the time when the world we live in wasn't even on anyone's mind and how to apply these rules to make it possible for a world now that you can have a million investors at a very early stage into it. Because of that need, the new instruments like convertible notes, like the save, et cetera. But you're an investor, shareholder or not, is far less material. But typically, at one point, you will become a shareholder, and then you get payout and cash out. All right, so, and what would be that point? Like, when do you make the, the, the shift from being an investor to being a shareholder? Yep, so uh, the instrument that we created to make it possible for founders and companies to deal with so many people is that if and when they experience a liquidity event, meaning a merger acquisition or going IPO, then they will convert everyone into shareholders. And then, because you're a shareholder, you get paid out or get cashed out and then leave the company. All right. Because otherwise, if you keep 10 million shareholders on the cap table, the cost of administering it is exceedingly high to comply with corporate law. All right. Very, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. Very, very good question. And thank you so much for your detailed answer. I have a question on ICO initial coin offerings. It's, uh, many startups are doing that in the last few years. And uh, frankly, uh, most of them are just sp scams. Right. You know, they you know, issue a coin and get $10, $20 million and, and not doing anything. Then SEC start regulating that for, for bigger um, ICOs. So what, what's your view on the you know, smaller ones, which are still happening um, in Silicon Valley and sometimes in, around the world? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, you know when the ICO boom in 2017, in 2016, um, it gave all of us at Republic, uh, you know, warm and fuzzy feelings all over because it's a true real life validation of our model in the future where thousands of individuals and not venture capitalists finance random projects and companies not here in Silicon Valley, not out of Google, but can be out of Singapore or wherever. So crowd investing in its best form was ICO back in 2016. Now, it was done in a non-compliant way with US securities law, so the law caught on and so now you apply laws and regulations, many of which are meant to prevent fraud and scams perpetuated on the investing public. But it does come with bells and whistles. So it makes it a little bit more difficult for people to participate, know your customer, anti-money laundering and whatnot. So you're seeing a, in many ways, a healthy contraction of that type of financial product. But at Republic, we're trying to make that compliant and easy and get back to one point when a credible project can raise $10, 20000000 million without having to go and pound a pavement on Sand Hill Road because she happens to be not living in America and not economically possible to do that. Um, so I'm very optimistic about blockchain technologies and startups that are built or leveraged that technology in the long run. Uh, and Republic itself is applying some of that as well. Oh, and I, I wanted also to, you know, highlight something, and, and I will just let you answer to this, but you could say at Republic we do this, and Republic would be only you in a garage in Palo Alto, uh, or it could be, a, you know, a bigger team. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, under the hood, like your organization, how many people you are, where they are located, uh, you yes, know, and this uh, definitely. I, uh, I was uh, general counsel for AngelList, and we spun out uh, and set up shop in New York because 
that's the seed of the capital market, and most people still have never invested privately. Uh, so our team, uh, probably slightly different than a lot of true tech startup in the Valley, uh, we're pretty equal, purposely so, between engineering, business, and then obviously compliance, being an investment company. Uh, there are about 50 of us, uh, have, most of us are in New York. There's a small office in San Francisco. Among the team, the seven former attorneys turned business or engineer uh, to navigate this confluence of legal and innovation. Um, and uh, we have a mildly distributed team, but there's still a core uh, team based out of New York. All right, so, and, and here what I, what I meant to, to get from you, which I do get, is that this is not just you or, or, or two or three people in a garage. <laughs> this is like solidly enough organized already that you have some very serious people in every department of this, making sure that this work is sustainable and this is efficient and compliant and everything. Oh, absolutely, because we're so heavily regulated for touching retail investor. I think we've been audited something like a dozen times by FINRA and the SEC in two and a half years. That's why we have so many lawyers in-house. <laughs> um, we have on the business bench people who have background experience at BlackRock at McKinsey, um, one of our founding advisors founded the Malala Fund, whose work got Malala the Nobel Peace Prize, so uh, influencers and what have you. Uh, Jason Kidd, uh, the athlete, is a, and Chameleon Nair, the rapper, uh, are both uh, advisors and influencers for us. So to do and to build on this vision, it takes more than a village. It takes partnership and uh, the goodwill of people across all different sectors of society. I know that it's very hard to determine a valuation of a company, particularly very early on. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is Republic's involvement in valuing a company before they uh, create an offering on your site? And how will that scale as you have thousands or millions of companies uh, on your platform? Uh, thanks again for the question on valuation and due diligence. So in the past two and a half years, we've gotten, uh, I think by now, almost 5,000 applications. And we've done due diligence on, depending on the level of due diligence, but not all of them. And we've launched less than 5% uh, on Republic. When it comes to valuation, there's actually no real math, particularly for an early company. Your valuation is whatever investors are willing to invest in you. So we typically look at if they have raised money before, then use that as a potential point of data. If they have never raised money before, then we want to make sure that it is at least in line with the current ecosystem. To give you an example, YC startups typically raise at about $10, 15000000 million in valuation, pre-product, pre-market, just to do. In New York, the same team out of New York City would be probably 25, 30% less in valuation because venture capitalists in New York aren't just as willing to fund a company that's valued at 15 million pre-market. So applying all of these relative lens that we pass a reasonableness and it's still up to the founders to do their work and convince investors and strangers and families and friends to make that investment. Kendrick, what are some of the challenges of expanding these investment opportunities to international markets outside of the US? Uh, thanks, Kobe. Uh, on our platform today, the companies have to be based in the US for now, even though we have partnership with different platforms in other continents. But we have investors from like 30 or 40 countries uh, around the world investing on Republic. Uh, going back to uh, a rather trite statement that good ideas exist everywhere, um, I really look forward to the day where you know, people here and in New York uh, at lunchtime go on it, look at a bunch of companies in Africa or Latin America, and this our small amount, and happen to build and make meaningful businesses that create jobs in those regions. Uh, so the future is very much global when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, you, so you talk about micro investing and invest twenty thirty dollars per company, uh, but. Given the high risk of early stage startups, one has to uh, invest many more, say 100, 200 companies to average the risk and return. So how do you think that average John Doe can manage such a large portfolio? Uh, when it comes to the 
very high risk of angel investing. The name of the game is diversification, as you mentioned. So on AngelList as an example, uh, the minimum amount usually is higher than $1,000, but the lowest is got to be $1,000. That's a lot of money for most people in this world. If you can reduce that down to $100 and allow $10 investment into 10 companies, that changes the landscape of things. And hopefully at one point, we can even bring it down to like $5 or $2. My family immigrated here from Vietnam. And I remember when we first moved here, my mom used to send back like $100 a month to a couple of her sisters. The transaction fee on that transaction was, I think, $13 or $14 to the sister in a larger city, and like $17 to someone in a smaller town, which is absurd, but it was, that's what everyone lived with. Now in a day, given that Vietnam is very warm to like crypto technology, you can make the same transaction and the fee be less than a dollar. So, and we're, two, we're like 2 a.m. into this new day, so I have no doubt that a couple years out, a person with a $50 saving, not the money that she needs to put food on the table, would be able to deploy that $50 into 10 or 20 companies and still potentially get a meaningful return out of it net net down the road. Is this microtransaction model really better than the AngelList syndicate model where you have some professional that goes in and vets the, invest, like the companies a little better first? Because we know that even some of the best investors don't actually succeed better than the S&P 500, so. Uh, the question about uh, venture validation and elite investor investing is addressed in two different ways. Just because you allow micro-investing, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have that validation. So I think 27 or 28% of the companies on Republic had been venture-backed, so already went through that lens. Now, on the other hand, the problem with venture investing is that a fund like Sequoia would only pick startups that they think potentially can yield them the proverbial unicorn 50x, at the very least 20x, 5x, not interesting, it's not enough that fits into the economic model. If you have uh, two founders building a business in East Oakland, there will never be more than a $20 million company but that creates 500 jobs for single moms in East Oakland, and you happen to just want to support that particular business and get two or three X back, that currently you don't have that, that avenue on AngelList or with any venture fund. So I view vend uh, entrepreneurship and investing, it has to be. Silicon Valley has done a lot of good, but that's like V2. We're now ready for like that next stage that people have a say in the type of businesses that get finance and that will you know, create a world that we'll be living in 10 years from now on. Uh, you mentioned that Republic will take a portion of uh, the companies that are on your platform. Can you share what that is and is that consistent uh, for each company? Yes, so currently I'm just gonna use uh, a very specific use case. So there's a uh, company that raised on Republic uh, when we first launched, uh, six months out. And now she has gone on to raise additional capital from VC. The founder, um, a Latina mom, who was working for a corporate, uh, in corporate for a grocery chain, doesn't have a technical background, doesn't fit the lens of someone who would get venture backing. And she just needed that $50,000, $60,000 to build out the first model, hire an, you know, an engineer and a business person and grow. So we were like, all right, we think that she's incredible and resilient and her experience saving money is so relevant to building a business. So we launched a campaign and she raised about $80,000. Uh, a lot of it was financed by you know, Latino American professionals in the Bay Area and beyond. Out of that $80,000, uh, the, the time and money that we've deployed into it was probably, I'm gonna guess, 20,000, it being the very first project. But the math is that we get 6% out of the amount successfully raised, so 6% of 80,000, plus we get a security interest in her company worth 2% of the amount raised. So in this case, a $1,600 worth of her equity. 
if she, she's building um, an employment training platform that trains very low level employees to mid-level management. The shopping bag cashier at Safeway and Lucky into assistant manager. If she somehow becomes the LinkedIn of the world, that one point six, that one sixteen hundred dollars stake that we have may be worth millions. And if that's the case, we're going to send that back to uh, investors on. Thank you so much, Kenry, for joining. And I want to thank you for two things. The first thing is sharing with us your knowledge and your and your experience and your you know your company's history and life and mission, which was very interesting. And the other thing also is I want to thank you for sharing your story because it's very inspiring. You being, you know, coming from Vietnam, having grown to be a, a, a Stanford a fellow at Stanford Law, uh, becoming an entrepreneur, connecting back to the world, giving it back to the world. As you know, at Google, we, we really embrace diversity. We want all, not only diversity, but inclusion. Like it's not only you're in the nightclub, but you're invited to dance, right? So inclusion. and. What everything you say uh, spins a positive light on, on the world, uh, on how it's doing, on how it's going to become, and on these values that we hold very dear, and you're a living example of those values, connecting technology to good business, to good, to good value and initiatives from people, respecting what we call here, respecting the opportunity, uh, and all this in great ethics and transparency. So, Thank you for all of this. It was a pleasure having you. I'm so thrilled to have had you today, you know, and I'm looking forward to everything that's going to happen for Republic in the coming years. And uh, I want to wish you the best of success with Thank us. you so much, Bryce. It's truly an honor to be here. And I want to thank everyone at Google for having me. I think the model of, of do good uh, is something that's like close to my heart. Google is the first company that put do good together with profit. And that's what gave rise to Republic. And you know, on the personal level, it's incrementally we do what we can to live up to something that you guys have perpetuated uh, all throughout the globe. So thank you so much. All right. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.